Hello. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, <laughs> and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two newcomers into the temple. They are the dub the the double-headed five star five star tribute summon that is double summon games. <laughs> hello, hello. That's a good way of referring to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Uh my name's Nora Haynes. Um, I'm the lead designer on our first project, um, Perfect Draw. Mm -hmm. um, and Iris, um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Iris St. Clair, and I am the uh, secondary writer and primary editor of Perfect Draw. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Usually when I have these, these sort of pairs, I end, up at, I end up asking which one's the Abbot and which one's the Costello. <laughs> but... Oh... There, but that's a, that's question. a bit of a deep cut. Yes, oh. I have to figure that one out. Have you ever heard who's on first? Yes, <laughs> that's that's the correct answer. Yeah, that's classic. <laughs> yeah, Abbott and Castell is the duo behind that. Yes, and gotcha. Mm -hmm. A little before my time, um, but I have heard of them, and of course, um, seen the um, the, the many references to them. Yeah. Oh, well, most of the time, Nora's the si uh, the silly woman, and I'm the straight girl, I guess. Except not straight. You get one. Regardless of gender, the term that the term that's always used is straight man, just for convenience's sake. Yes. Um, yeah. In the same way, we refer to a um, like our um, our um, like archetypes within theater and so forth as well. Your commedia dell'arte stuff. Mm -hmm. Or. Whenever I've whenever I've talked about productions, I've I've often said that regardless of size, a production needs to have that one person who is the guy. Sometimes the guy yes. is not a guy, but you need the guy. You need. I think the the modern term would probably be like the mum friend, um, which is to say the person who actually keeps people on track to getting things um, done and sorts out when there's like little disputes that don't actually matter. Mm -hmm. So. One of the traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I'd like both of you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, Iris, I think technically you had it first, so you should probably go first. Uh, I was always kind of a loner as a child, and when I was in when I was like fourteen years old, I want to say, uh, and. I was basically taking solace entirely in online groups, and I ended up playing in various play-by-post role plays around that time. Mm -hmm. And as someone who had been obsessed with the writing ever since I was like six, uh, I just fell into it naturally, and now I'm here. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, my story's a bit of a, a weird one. Um, you do you know um, like Homestuck from ages ago? Yeah. Um, yeah, regrettably, we all are forced to know about it online. But when I was a teen, I was very into it, and I wrote a fan adventure, which was a thing where people would create stories in a similar format on the MSPA forums. Mm -hmm. um, I got very um, into that. I had one going for several months. And at one point, I was very interested in how do I improve? How do I get better at making this um, improv better, get better at this? And the, the thing that people suggested was, the skills um, for writing these sorts of response-based um, stories are very similar to um, GMing a role-playing game. Of course, at the time, they just said playing Dungeons & Dragons, um, but that's where it got me started. I started looking into anything. Whenever I got interested in something, I research very, very heavily. Um, and this man. is about the time when um, 5e was starting to really hit its heyday. Um, so I got very into that. I watched like um, you know every fucking uh, Matt Colville video and every um, advice video. I started getting into these people who would just do um, reviews of the um, very old D and D books. Mm -hmm. um, but then I start playing it, and at some point I realize shit, D and D isn't doing what I want out of a role playing game. 
Um, and I start to expand out from there. Um, especially, I believe the game that first pitches me on it actually is, um, God, it would have been Masks, I think? Because at some point I start listening to the, um, the One Shot Network. Um, and they do a game on Masks that I really, really enjoyed. And I love the idea of getting to, to follow through those sorts of, um, stories. And from there, I start, um, researching everything else. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get that. Now, I'm guess I'm guessing it was the experience with masks that was your introduction to Powered by the Apocalypse, which is what you're using for Perfect Draw. Sort of. I I, I sort of stand by that we uh, we we are using Powered by the Apocalypse um, in a very um, loose way, which is to say we've thrown out most of it. But if you've read Powered by the Apocalypse games, you could probably grok it and understand it. Mm -hmm. We sure are a 2D6 game with principles and playbooks. Yes. And um, but when we started this project, that was everyone was calling every project like that Powered by the Apocalypse. And then by the time we have now, we've definitely moved into a space as a culture where games that follow those systems don't always get called PBTA at this point. Yeah, and... The idea of using that as a base and then coming up with something that isn't exactly that one to one is in good company. Um, yes, that's how, that's how stuff like Rollmaster got started. It was originally mm -hmm. a set of house rules for AD and D, and then it just expanded and evolved into its own thing. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably how most games um, get started at this point. Um, you start with something and you realize there's a problem that the thing you want to do can't be done. How do you solve that? Yeah, which is so, which is something I always find fascinating when um, somebody when unlike unlike in other mediums, the barrier mm -hmm. to do that whole well well just fix it yourself is the lowest that it can get. Yeah, uh, maybe with the exception really of have... some specific video games. Like, you don't have to write code, you don't have to do art, you don't have to do, like, complex writing, you just need to twiddle with some mechanics. But, like, I think that's... Uh, for fixing things, sometimes, sure, that, that'll do it for your group. But, like, sometimes you do need to, like, rework mechanics and concepts from the ground up, I feel. Yeah, and I think, to be fair, being a, a, a GM in any sort of way sort of requires you to be a little bit of a game designer. Just a, just a smidge, even with the most, like, well-designed game that's covering every possibility. Um, your games that are, like, um, basically, you here is everything that's going to happen. We're going to basically give you a script. You still have to be a little bit of a um, game designer and consider what feels fun and fair and respond to players. And you're, you're effectively playtesting at the table, sort of. And that, that builds those skills, and I think is one of the core reasons that um, you get so many people making these sorts of things, is if, unlike other mediums, it trains you to make the next thing. If you're um, GMing a game, you're getting a lot of the basic skills you need to make a game. Not all of them, obviously, there's a lot of obvious stuff, but at least to get started. And then from there, uh, you, you, you can just go ham. That's yeah. not really something that's true of um, most video games, um, most book, uh, books to some extent, um, but most um, video games, most movies. Mm -hmm. oh. I've off one of my mantras here in the temple is nobody plays Uno as written. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very true. Everybody's everybody's got the everybody's got their own their own rules. I've there are yeah. little house rules, even if they don't necessarily recognize that that's what those are, or make the game better. Um, uh, one I know of, it in my oh one of mine was whenever the reverse card is played instead instead of the turn order being reversed. No, you just you just switch hands with the guy to your left. Oh yeah, and that's a a very fun one. I think. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the, the, the funnest it's house telling stories... that a lot of, like, Uno variations do add that as, like, a card or effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, I Uno think... spin swap hands. I love you, Uno spin swap hands. 
Um, but I think one of the, 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 the wildest examples of sometimes where um, you can add a house rule and then um, it makes the game sort of worse is um, Cluedo, because it is very popular with Cluedo to have people take a game that has a lot of um, assumptive features in it, for example, mm -hmm. where you can make um, assumptions, like you're a, you're a mystery guy. Oh, you seem to not be going towards the kitchen. Therefore, I assume that you already have a kitchen card. And then siphon that all out so that it's more random because they want to make sure that um, anyone at the table can win. <laughs> oh, yeah. And... <laughs> Now, with the, with that in with that in mind, I'd like to yes. the other the other end of the origins equation is deal is dealing with the fact that this is this is built around re, on replicating the feel of a car, of what you refer to as a card game anime. Yes, and mm -hmm. um, or a toy anime for a generic term. But we use a card system. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, toy anime has definitely become very popular, and you could probably do a a Bakugan or a Beyblade, Beyblade style Flash thing. Mecha. Slash like... um, Bottle Man's very popular right now. Mm -hmm. But the, the 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 system definitely requires the least work to do a card game ones because it's by far the most popular because it's the most profitable. Yeah. The I so I suppose I'm get I'm guessing that I'm guessing that the two of you grew up in that. Um, that TCG boom that we that we saw in the yes. '90s and two and 2000s. I'm guessing your introduction yeah. to this idea of card game anime would be, nah, obviously not the obviously not the OG Yu-Gi-Oh because because nobody no. saw that for years. But we're in Australia, <laughs> um, so um, we're in Australia, so things got released to us at very weird paces. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of the the channels where we would have been getting things. At around the time where, um, say, GX, the sequel mm -hmm. to um, Yu-Gi-Oh! is coming out, um, the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series is airing here, especially mm -hmm. in that early 2000s period. Mm -hmm. I never really watched the anime on, uh, until later in my life, though I did watch the Pokemon anime a little bit. Like The, the main thing similar. is that my, my, uh, my parents didn't really have, like, channel TV or the like, so the, uh, the only real exposure I got who got to these kinds of things was, like, they once got me, like, a single, like, DVD. But the main thing that got me exposed to card games in general was... It, it, it's a very formative memory of mine. Uh, so... Flashback, I'm like five years old, six years old, oh, uh, going into school for the first time. Um, and I, uh, uh, I will walk into my first primary school class and I see like a bunch of kids playing like Yu Gi Oh!, Pokemon, etc. at the table, and it looks mm -hmm. cool. They're having a lot of fun, they're laughing, they're getting dramatic with it. And I go over and ask them if I can join. They're like, No, you don't have a deck. And I'm like, Oh. And then Aww. much later in that school year, a bunch of like kids that were gonna like graduate from uh, from primary school or elementary school for you in America, uh, uh, decided to give me a couple of cards. One of which I oh. still have today, and despite it being a bulk common of a bad card that means nothing to anyone else, I still have mm. it in the sleeve. It means a lot to no, me. The same thing happened to me, actually. Uh, I don't think we went to the same school. To be clear, we did not. Uh, yes, but the same thing happened to me where. Right as the first Yu-Gi-Oh! boom was hitting. We were a very poor family at that point. I could not buy cards. Um, even though I was very interested in the anime, I was simultaneously watching both the original series and GX on YouTube, where I was able to find it. Mm -hmm. um, but as that was happening, people were playing it, and I would be one of those people who would... Um, I was way younger than them. In like, um, They were grade 7, whereas I was grade 4. Um, and they were playing Yu-Gi-Oh! probably badly, and I would hover around them and just watch and go like, oh my god, that's so cool. So as the, the grade 7 started to move out, one of them um, gave me basically uh, whatever bulk cards they didn't want out of the pack. And the packs they would get, because they were a um, fairly well-off kid. Um, and I was like, you know, the, this cute little kid who was sitting around and um, watching them and whatever, and they, I, I guess they wanted to give pity to me. Um, 
and then after that, um, right as we were actually coming to a bit of a, a better position financially as a family, M McDonald's had the um, the Yu Gi Oh fucking um, the Yu Gi Oh card packs as um, Happy Meal toys. So I got heavy into that, asking my parents to let me come on, let's go to McDonald's. I want these card packs. Oh my god, they're so cool! They because it's uh, the it was tied to the release of GX in Australia, which I'd already been watching, so I was very excited to see some of those really cool cards that, that I really liked um, get over there. Um, and that was uh, very exciting for me. And at that point, eventually, I start being that, that, that cringe kid that, as those kids went out, started the club. Um, getting people into it. Doing, funnily enough, a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! roleplay... Um, with other kids at the school, where we would um, pretend to fill out the storylines of especially GX, because as students, the student storyline very um, felt very keen with us. And then, from there, I got very, very, very into this website called Yu-Gi-Oh! Card Maker. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it? I have. Yep. Uh, but for anyone in the audience that hasn't, Yu-Gi-Oh! Card Maker was a site that allowed you to very easily make Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Um, you would just log in um, and you'd, you'd write down the stuff and you could save them as PNGs. And I went yeah. ham. Um, absolutely ham. Every day after school, I was making them and just experimenting with them with like, this would be a cool effect with no balancing in mind. Again, I was probably like 10 at this point. And eventually, um, I just, I, I got so addicted and obsessed that I wanted to keep doing it even when I didn't have access to a computer. And at that point, that having access to a computer was not that easy. Um, even at that point, uh, even if that, that was at the point where we had like two family computers, we didn't have enough where I could always access it. And sometimes we spent a lot of times in a car. So I got these big like um, books, like um, th those empty pages books. And I would just draw these little like ideas for cards and then eventually come back to um, the Yu-Gi-Oh card maker and put them in and submit them on the forums and get banned from the forums because I was 10 years old and looked like I was trolling. Mm -hmm. uh, but th that's where my journey starts. Yeah. Um, in the interest of completeness, I will note that I ended up, to, be because of the fact that I was going in and out of um, Shinders, which was the big, mm -hmm. um, ho the big hobby store um, chain in the Twin Cities for for like twenty years, um, uh -huh. I ended up I ended up going through a lot of different card games. Yu Gi Oh was ju was just mm -hmm. one was just one more to the pile. Um, there were yeah. there were quite a few that I, there were quite a few that I went through um, around that time. A lot of the anime ones, the yeah. the, the DBZ both the DBZ and Saint Seiya card games I had gone through. Oh um, God, I, the. Obviously, obviously, forms of magic, um, Legend of the Five Rings. Yeah. Although I prefer the role playing game more to more than the card game for various reasons. Very fair. Um, the there was there, I think I I think I got dragged into trying the Neopets game once, and that was that was enough for me to say I wasn't interested. Hello. Hilariously enough, I was about to bring up the Neopets card game. I'm like, oh yeah. Yeah. Because you were a big Neopets kid, weren't you? Pardon? You were a fairly be big Neopets kid, right? Uh, me and my sibling were both a little bit Neopets kids. I kind don't of, remember um, exactly. Good Christmas gift level. Yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was good Christmas gift level. I never actually was on the Neopets side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, oh, there's also some, some more offbeat stuff, like, say... Um, Warlord, which mm -hmm. which bills itself as the card game you already know how to play. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, uh, the as well as well as card game adaptations for like BattleTech and um, Warhammer and a, a lot of the yes. card games that were put out by Fantasy Flight Games back in the day. Um, that was absolutely the boom where um after after like Yu Gi Oh Pokemon um. And to a lesser extent, Magic had like huge kid successes. Everyone thought they could do it in the same way that everyone thought they could do an MMO. Yeah, there. I will admit that there were that there were some ideas that were uh, more interesting than others. Absolutely. Score was my whipping boy when it came to 
card games that I d that I just did not have all that much interest in, because a lot yeah. of them, because a lot, it felt like they were trying to replicate the success they had with the DBZ card game, except they mm -hmm. didn't, except they didn't have James Ward working on it. <laughs> yeah. Which, since James Ward was was yep. the was the guy who was the who was the spearhead behind those. Um, SSI PC games for TSR mm -hmm. back in the day, and I've had him on the sh I've had him on the show in the past. Mm -hmm. And oh. so I get so getting so getting to hear his experience with wa with watching those early DBZ episodes and taking notes for how the card game would work was mm. an interesting experience. But I'll actually ask I'll... you a question. Oh yes. Oh go go ahead. Yeah, I'll ask you a question. As someone who was um, in more of a mature state when the first um, card game boom happened, what are your thoughts on the um, the discussion that would ha that um, is going around right now? I think that um, we're sort of entering the next boom, the next card game boom, especially ever since the, um, the the big finance market push that happened after COVID. It does feel like a lot of um, card games are trying to really push again into these markets, especially outside Japan, where that boom never quite ended in the same way. Um, but now back into um, Western countries, uh, we have a lot of high-profile games coming out. The, the Digimon game, the One Piece game, um, obviously is like the big Namco Bandai anime game push. Um, Wixos um, has been getting a new real push, Shadowverse, um, Lorcana, obviously, um, and uh, Altered is doing very well on Kickstarter right now. What are your thoughts on that as a comparison between these two periods? Um... There's been, I know a lot of people will look at it as a boom, but the the thing is, is that you can only really look at a boom period in hindsight. Um, True. I had said a similar thing with that one idiot who claimed that the golden age of TTRPGs is over, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. and when I and when I looked at some of the things, I was like, you fucking numpty, you haven't yeah. you, because he had, because um. You're locked into a perspective of how you yeah. play games now, rather and than imagining the future. When it comes, and what I what I see out of out of this rise in a bunch in a bunch of different card games, is less of a less of a boom. That's that's um marketing bullshit, and yes. more of an, an an evolution of something that was already happening over the mm. over the course of of about five years. Yeah. That being. There, there was a, there was a, there was a rising tide when it came to when it came to board, when it came to board and card games with the yes. rise of board and card game bar, bars and establishments. Basically, um, re the whole th the whole thing of being able to rent a ta a table or the like at mm -hmm. various establishments, um. Which it, which in yeah. of itself was building on the re the rent arcade set set up that you would see in places like Dave and Buster's, and I think this does coincide with um the the mix of both COVID um people after COVID especially wanting to get community again and during COVID in the pandemic and the hit of um online clients like uh, Magic Arena for example yeah, th and um, eventually I think this Master was an I know a lot of people say that 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 a, that a lot of that boom happened because of COVID. I am of the opinion that it was going to happen regardless. COVID just accelerated yes. it. I think that's true of a lot of things. Um, at least the things that didn't like COVID didn't basically say this was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I, I think it's a convergence of a lot of things as well because yes. obviously it's also the convergence of um, role playing games hitting their inevitable success as um, people start to push it. Um, Things coming out, the, the 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 move to the nerd concept becoming something more accessible, and the um the increasing cheap cheapness of um card printing as well, obviously, um and Kickstarter, um as well, and Hearthstone coming out, bringing people's um general gamers' attention back to card games, Slay the Spire as well, um bringing people's back attention back to card games again. Yeah, which is the thing. The thing is, is that it's. When it comes to, when it comes to observing these these sort of things, it's, a lot of people have a very forest for the trees outlook on things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like th when you mention all of the all of those card games that are ju that are just coming out, a lot of people are looking at that that mm -hmm. um that variety a as if it just as if it just happened with True. a with a um big with a big bang snap snap of the fingers kind kind of thing, 
in the last year in the last year or so when that's never how this yeah. kind of thing works it's i will always... say i do think there is a difference and that is mainly in how much these games are being played in local games i would say um, the difference is in variety yes I, i'm not sure what exactly that might be it might be the um the fact that to some extent people have been very very and like people have always been mad at their the, the big card games for other reasons um, um, but there have been his like people are increasingly mad at Magic the Gathering. Um, people are uh, less people are being able to be onboarded to Yu Gi Oh. There's a um, there's a parallel that I that I'd yeah. like to bring up, and that and that is um in the in the fighting game scene. Yes, Street Fi Street Fighter was for the was for the longest time the Atlas holding everything up. Yes, however. Because of, because of because of certain entries that did not um, meet standard, um, mm -hmm. some people some people say Street Fighter Five was where, was where this kind of thing started. I would I would say a bit I would say a bigger canary in the coal mine was Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite and all the shitstorm that happened. Yes. And don't don't get me wrong, MVCI is not is not a bad fighter. It's just that mm -hmm. it made a very very bad first impression. And you made people right, very mad by not including Wolverine. And right around the well, there was that. There was some of the ugly designs. There was the yes. false rumor that somebody was hitting the Capcom designs with an ugly stick to make the Marvel designs look better. That wasn't <laughs> that wasn't true. That wasn't true. Um, and then right and then right around that same time, Arc System Works strikes with Dragon Ball Fighter Z. Which yes. was doing what they were already doing for several years, just with just with the DBZ IP and doing that three on three tag setup that MVCI wasn't doing. And, and obviously, just like with TCGs, there were always other fighting games that had some success. You know, um, Guilty Gear had been going on for ages. Um, Smash Brothers has obviously had like a long history. But you're yeah. definitely right that from a um. A perspective, perspective, um, community space perspective, tournaments perspective. Street Fighter is now a, a lot more equal. It's a, it's a lot more, it's a lot more equal because, with with the mistakes that were made with both with both that with say Street Fighter Cross Tekken and how that project mm. didn't didn't live up to the full potential that it had, and then then the fiascos surrounding Street Fighter Five, um, other other um games. Took, adva took advantage of that mistake. As Napoleon said, never yeah. interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. And yeah. so you started to see a lot more people jumping into anime or doujin fighters. You saw a lot of people diving mm -hmm. into... I was I would say you saw more people diving into Smash, but because of the shitty-ass netcode issues... Yeah. Um, that I would say hampered... Strive was the one that really took full advantage of it, right? Like... It... Guilty Gear Strive comes out a couple years after that and is now maybe the most played fighting game... I At would the moment, um, I would say, I would, I would, I would honestly, I would honestly say the 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 one who benefited the most was Bandai Namco, because right now the True. king has been Tekken for the last few years, and that True. trickled down to Soul Calibur and a brief return of um, Samurai Showdown. And obviously, more respect brought to um, all of their um, Shonen Jump fighting um, games as well. That yeah. None of those pass nowadays without at least people trying to see if they're fun. The only the only one that's ri that's really gotten a lot of shit in that regard was Jump Force. Oh, yes. Oh, I recently played Jump Force. Dear, have you ever played Jump Force? Actually, uh, I have watched videos of other people playing it, and it looks dog shit. It, it's interesting. I I, I highly respect it. Uh, to bring it all back to you here. Mm -hmm. I, I did jump on that game because I wanted to play as Yami. I wanted to play as um, Yami Yugi because that sounded fun as hell. And the pitch of how do you do a Yami Yugi in a Shonen Jump crossover fighting game? Oh, you make them use cards as their moves? Cool as hell. And then you play it and it's really mid. I'm pretty sure if I dug around enough, I could find somebody who made him in in Mugen that, d that does a better job. Hell, I. Yes. Um. I feel like if you dug around enough, you could find anyone making basically any popular character in Mugen, so that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, yeah. And for for me, for me, per, for me personally, 
Um, there was a, there was also the rise of the of um a con of a concept called the living card game, which yes. was mm. a, and a return of de a return of deck building card games after the popularity mm -hmm. of Dominion. So yes. there's a, oh, it's, and, and hey. interesting story. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, interesting story about Dominion. The part of the reason why that happens, and I think it's really interesting, is just because um, printing costs for cards get substantially cheaper. Mm -hmm. Dominion is a design that's like had hints in board games for a long time. Um, people will often compare it to um, a lot of other engine builders that have existed historically. But the thing that makes Dominion inevitable when it comes out is that printing costs for cards, especially for board game style situations, gets so much cheaper that you no longer have to use um, like cardboard punch-out boards, which was previously what you realistically had to do. Mm -hmm. As a wise philosopher once said, if Dominion did not exist, it would be necessary to invent it. <laughs> that is how that quote goes, right? Yes. Uh, I think that is what they were talking about, yeah. Um, Excellent. Glad let's, we got that sorted. Let's, yeah. let's, go, with, let's go with that. Um, and I... I... I will I will admit that my that um my particular taste when it comes to card games is is all over the place. I had I had played my fair share of Yu-Gi-Oh and Magic, though mm -hmm. because of because of certain changes with both with both of them, I ended up I ended up um falling out. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, At this point, I don't play either except for a um a cube and battle box. We have a lot of and the, even though I still have my old decks. The thing that made mm -hmm. me have a falling out with Yu-Gi-Oh was the introduction of um, Pendulum Summons. It's and... a, I, that's interesting, I think, because Pendulum Summons are so interesting as the thing that hit a lot of people like that, but also represented nothing in the game. Like, Pendulum Summons are basically the same as um, Gemini Monsters. Um, you know Gemini Monsters, yeah. I assume. Yeah. They are main deck cards with a little bit of an effect. But the thing that really, I think, strikes people is that they... they uh, you know D&D, when D&D 4E comes out, and people have that complaint that it doesn't look like D&D to them? Oh, I have ripped that complaint to... I have ripped that I know. There but I feel it's the same thing that happened with Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, if... Allow me, allow me to, be, to be the devil and his advocate once again, and... Yes. Go, this is the... The reason that I had an issue with mm -hmm. with um pendulum with pendulum summons and later and later on with link summons is link summons have their own can of worms is the fact that unlike unlike some of these specialized summons that came that came before it it was not something that was that it was something that whole a whole new design a whole new set of mechanics and a whole new flow had to be introduced to justify it whereas yes. Um, I would argue some... that is less true of pendulums in theory, but definitely how they were presented. Yeah, it's um, definitely I true. Would, as someone who has a special interest in Yu-Gi-Oh, I think the problem with pendulums wasn't that they were, like, super ultra-broken or anything. In fact, when they came out until, like, full-power Pepe drop, they were kind of mid. The problem with pendulums is that they were clunky. They wanted to be, ooh, what if a monster that you could use, as, or also use as a spell, which is cool in concept, but then they, but then had they add, add on pendulum scales. They had to add something dr uh, dramatic and flashy for the anime, so ooh, what if you set scales, and, and then comparatively, what if you summoned a bunch of monsters? And, and then, then just comparatively, makes um, fusion, XCs, and synchro are fairly, um, you have your clean. main deck cards, and they're, they're fairly clean. I will say, personally, I argue that the, the, the downfall of Yu-Gi-Oh's design, as much as I think that XCs are great, it technically starts with them. Because XCs can happen, are completely generic. And I'll be, I love Yu-Gi-Oh as it is right now. Yeah. I think it's really, really fun. But the, the changing period of Yu-Gi-Oh, where it goes from a game with, um, in the Synchro era, where you have these very, um, Yu-Gi-Oh has very, various eras. The first era, I think, is also bad. Um, when it's basically just Magic the Gathering um, without a resource system, and it's um, play the best cards you can. And then the Synchro era starts to come up, and we have our period of um, decks that are, you know, our first combo decks. TGs come out in this period. We start getting um, all of the, 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 the cool archetypes that define much of what makes Yu-Gi-Oh! unique. 
um, combo strategies and combat lines and reactions and um, trap and um, reactive effects um, and hand traps and very um, free counterspell style stuff. Then we hit XEs and we start to hit a new era that I think changes things entirely, which is a sort of toolbox era. Because XEs, because any two cards of the same t of same level can have them, every deck now has an extra deck and should have an extra deck. Mm -hmm. Whereas previously, you needed to run otherwise um, lesser cards like tuners and um, polymerization um, and other fusion effects to be able to run them. Yeah. Now, th that be that being that being said. Um, yes. One other thing, one other concept that I that developed that very that very much interested me was using the card game motif, but not do, but um doing some doing things that were in the same vein, but not but not centered around mm. monster summoning. One of the big examples for me is UFS. Yes. Which was the first of three, which was was something I discovered along with two other games that were trying to emulate a fighting game concept in mm -hmm. card game form. And it and fighting games in, in card games had been done before, but it had been done in that mm -hmm. um, summoning, building your units ki kind of way. Like and, Flesh and Blood does today, basically. Yeah. And whereas whereas UFS, it you were building your deck around a particular um, character and... The, and that and and that was a unique setup. Obviously, there, yeah. obviously, there's also um, Yomi and ba and Battlecon. Um, Big fan of Battlecon. I have the whole yeah, collection. I, uh, the I, I used to play Yomi uh, quite a bit, and then Nora introduced me to Battlecon, and I was like, "Wow, this is way better at simulating fighting game stuff." <laughs> Yomi and they're doing the same thing, but they're doing it in different manners. It, it is a very apples and oranges thing. In yes, fact, say, yeah. I do think they sort of have the vibes of different card games, um, of different fighting games. I mean, I'd, I'd um, say Yomi um, definitely feels very. Um, what was that one fighting game that was all about having? That was all about using swords. Um, Sam. Um, there's Soul Samurai Calibre? Showdown. I think no, no. <laughs> if you're talking, if um, you're talking about just swords, um. The one with everyone had like very slow play um, sword strategies, and then everything comboed off. Um, that that would probably be that'd probably be Samurai Showdown. Yeah, yeah, Samurai Showdown. Uh, it felt very much Yomi to me. Having had a period with fighting games where I was never good at them, always felt like um, Samurai Showdown to me. Whereas um, Universal Fighting System felt very much more like felt more like playing Street Fighter, and Battlecon felt more like playing a lot of um, anime fighters at the time, like um, Zerd and. Um, and Grand Blue and so forth. And I'd I'd say I I go one step further and bring up Do and bring up some of the Dojin fighters, especially some of those yes. really crazy ones that would that would show up at Comic Cat that were um, one person jobs. But yeah, getting I mean just every Toho fighter, too. every um, VN fighter. Um, Hi Melty Blood, they're How all you doing? very fun. Yeah, Melty Blood. Oh, I still oh, play. Yeah. I still love the um, Umineko one. Um, I think about it every day of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, there was there was one uh, there was one other that there was I do remember around that time I discovered a a weird um take on Mugen called Babel Sword that was trying to do a fighter Ooh. a fighter mixed with a bullet hell. Ooh. Oh, this I, I remember this. Oh, because I remember this because I was um. Uh, it's a yeah, it's it's a Mugen thing trying to do a um, a, a basically trying to do a, a, a yeah, like a, a that. But the cool, I remember this mainly because I was um in the Toho community at the time, and people kept pitching this like, okay, we need to make every Toho character that exists in this. Um, and the and then you then years then years later, level ninety nine does bullet, which is basically them trying to put bo a bullet hell into a board game, but. Yeah, but, but they make it more like a puzzle game. Is the like a like a gem collection game like you would? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Like um, what's the what what's the big one that was big on um, phones for a while again? A Candy door? Crush. Candy Crush. Candy. Yeah. Um, or like Street Fight, or like um Street um 
Street they, Fighter puzzle. Puzzle Fighter. Puzzle Fighter was puzzle the one Fighter, they specifically yeah. um brought, specifically invoked. But yes. yeah. getting getting back into the heart of things with Perfect Draw, I given the ten mm. um given the ten playbooks, I'd like to run a bit of word of word association with you with you Go two. Go for it. So Go ahead. I'm going I'm going to list off the na the names of the um play of the ten ba the ten main playbooks. I'll mm -hmm. I might get I might get to some to some of the uh to any to any, stre any stretch based ones lit in a moment. But just starting with mm -hmm. these. I want I want you to list off a, a character from any card game at anime that com that comes to mind or would be a good would be a good representative of what th of what that playbook is meant mm -hmm. to embody. We've had a lot of fun um, talking about this, so I'm very glad I'm excited so to talk about that. Think of this as the world's shittiest Rorschach test. Let's go. The Spoiler result... alert, um uh Jaden. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the prodigy. The Prodigy is Seto Kaiba, um, as well as Declan Akaba um, from um, Arc V is another big inspiration. And basically every Seto Kaiba like that gets released in every further, not just Yu-Gi-Oh! series, but um, inspired series. Even, um, back, uh, even back then, true story, my my, my colleagues kept um, peer pressuring me to cosplay as Seto Kaiba. I think it's because, of course. Oh, I think it's because Tall Guy. That and but to use a, um, a, another example, he would also be your Gary Oak, um, <laughs> a, a, as a yeah. Um, and we explicitly, I think he has one of his abilities is um he has a bunch of cohorts we've given him as an optional ability you can take, mm -hmm. and we explicitly want to make sure that they could both be so that they could so that they could you could do Gary Oak they could both be like corporate goons and also a fan club that shows up and says yay go go go. Um. Though per personally, that personally, I've my I've I've stated many times my favorite incarnation of that archetype is goddamn Jack Atlas. Yes, you have yes! to add, you have to add yeah. the goddamn part of it. It's like a drive called quest. Yes. You say the whole thing. <laughs> um, shout out to his um shitty Australian accent. Um, in the dub, beautiful. I never watched the dub. Oh, correct. You should You're correct. watch one You're episode watch just so you can hear his uh, shitty Australian accent. I watched. It's... Okay, let me correct myself. I watched one episode of the dub, and the puns were enough to make me punch a wall. <laughs> Very fair. I, you I would will not say, think, just to you defend the dub, because I watched French it as a kid. Too. I think that um, you say's voice is exquisite. Yeah. Um, the glowing. I think the key oh, yeah. example of the glowing, legitimately, and this is a bit of a deep cut for people who only know like the first couple series, is um the mo one of the most recent series, Yu Gi Oh Sevens. Yuga from Yu Gi Oh Sevens is what she's getting at. She doesn't want to say it outright because she gets her his name confused with Yu Gi Oh from Arc V frequently. They have so many new names at this point, but I was I was passing it on to you so you could say it. you didn't have to help me like that. Um. <laughs> But they are a great example of there. There are plenty of examples of characters that represent the glowing throughout, um, like card game history. Um, like obviously, I would probably do Taya as the mm -hmm. glowing, um, from the original series. But Yuga is a great example of a character that is the main protagonist or one of the main protagonists that is a glowing. Mm -hmm. Um, the Rogue. Um, uh, Ghost Girl of Rains. Yeah, Ghost Girl of Rains. I would also argue Mai from the original series. Yeah, fair. Um, I'd probably put Izayoi in, in that as well. Absolutely. Izayoi is the medium. 100% the oh, medium. No, no, yes. Yeah, no, she's 100% the medium. Right. Maybe with a couple of a bits from the rogue. She could take a couple of abilities from yeah. the rogue. Um, the ally. Well, the key example of the ally probably is... Uh, oh, I've forgotten his name, but the, the best example of the ally is actually it's a um, Vanguard character. Oh fuck! Vanguard character jump scare. I don't remember his name on the top of my head because I watched it ages ago, and this was like uh, one of the big things. But if anyone's a Vanguard fan, I'm sure they know who I'm talking about. Um, who are you gonna say, dear? Uh, I said Mr. Duke Devlin from Yu-Gi-Oh! DM. Um, yeah, legit. Duke Devlin's a great example. Um, even Tayer as well. There's a real argument for doing Tayer as well in this, or actually, uh, most of the teachers. 
most of the teachers from Yu-Gi-Oh! GX as well would probably be allies. Several of them in the Mentor, though, dear. True, but I would argue right now the, um, like, for example, Crowler is the ally. Yeah. yeah. Fair. Um, the Spirit. Oh, uh, Astral is probably the, the easiest example if you've seen Zexel. Mm -hmm. Um, like, the spirit represents every, like, less characters directly from Yu-Gi-Oh! all the time, but also, but characters from other toy anime as well. Um, if, if you've played, if you've watched other toy anime, like, uh, like, uh, in Bakugan, um, Dragon would be uh, the spirit. They're a character, they do things, but they are not a human. Mm. Um, recently, we've been, me and Iris have been watching, um, with one of our, with one of our partners, a, um, really bad, um, series. Um, called um, Mix Master, um, because I used to watch it as a kid and I wanted to, to see how bad it actually was. And several of the hench from that series would be um, spirits mm -hmm. uh, as well. Also, I from Brains is another great example. So, now next is the medium. We are, we already mentioned Izayo Aki, so I'm yes. so I'm not going. And no, I'm not I'm not using your dub name. Anyone who anyone who wants to force me to do that. Um, Good, good luck. <laughs> Five Ds is so funny because, like, everyone in, in GX previous, mm -hmm. everyone respects, even if they think there are better ones, the using the um, GX and DM names. Everyone after um, G after Five Ds, everyone just default uses the um, the the sub names. Mm -hmm. And then, if you exactly get to Five Ds, there is arguments, and I think that's fun. I've I. For me, it's not an argument. I'm pu I'm putting my flag in the ground, and <laughs> and I'm like, if you if you I will die on this hill, and you, and if you're gonna come at the king, you best not miss. Fair enough. I think the funniest change is just changing Rex's last name from Godwin to Goodwin. They just added another O. <laughs> um, but do you think I I do know why that one happens though? It's because they don't want to like imply the guy who eventually becomes a villain. Into being a um, a god associated character. Um, five five Ds had a had a rough had a rough go of things due to unfortunate bits of timing. Um, yes, especially especially over in Japan, you're probably familiar with the um, cult thing. No, that actually that this is funny. Myth. That was a myth. Um, it was a very popularized myth that could come at, that came out, but there is no evidence towards it. People just started assuming because um, one of the voice actors was there. There the, the, like, no statements the cult thing, made. The cult thing did happen, but that wasn't until like we were already a good bit of the way into season two. So Carly had already been like functionally written out by then. And by season two, I mean the latter half of Five Ds, not the Dark Signer as opposed to Fortune Cup stuff. Yeah, yeah, we were already like way we're we're, we're like twenty episodes away from the series ending at that. Mm -hmm. But so next would be the Destined, and uh, original Yami Yuji, mm -hmm. um, Marek also Bakura, um, anyone who has a um, a very clear destiny that's coming towards up uh, late game Jade, even you could argue. Yeah. Or um the, the Zexel guy as well. I forgot his name. Mm -hmm. Um the Zexel protagonist of all the number cards very easily. Yeah. Um I was also I was also gonna say Sartorius. Oh yeah? yes. Also of course, everyone in five Ds. Mm -hmm. Um they've all got the dragon bars. Um <laughs> The Idealist. Uh oh. you from Arc V. Um, Phoenix, um, from, um, from GX oh, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ed slash Aster. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and the Turncoat. Zane from GX is probably the easiest example. Yeah. Um, like, from the early series, they're probably the easiest example. But later on, we get a, um, a lot of characters in Zexel that were like, once we're bad guys, and now we're kind of good guys. Or um, we see it very often in um, in Sevens as well, where basically you have that um, Steven Universe arc of once we beat someone, we, we show them the, the their ways and they become a better person. Mm -hmm. Now, a few days ago, you had you had that poll that had that had some of the ones that aren't of the base ten that I'd want I wanted to go over in this same form. One of them being yes. the other me. 
The other me is Yami Yugi. Mm-hmm. Again. Yeah, oh. it's Yami Yugi, but we've made a yeah. playbook that for that stuff. Um, plurality, um, multiple people in someone's head is very key to a lot of early um, G- is a lot of, to early D- um, um, Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. And because like, of that, I it's like replicated. Season zero, mm-hmm. I feel like Season Zero and some parts of DM very much go in that, like, what is the, like, how does Yugi deal with this, you know? But Which is other key examples, I think, would be um, Yubel. Um, although they would also they could also be a spirit, and especially late Yubel, they are definitely a the other me for Jaden. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the facade. Oh, uh, uh, the facade some... is Soros Genuine from uh, uh, from Arcvi. Or Mimi um, from Sevens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is the is the facade meant to be meant to be someone who is basically be, being the equivalent of a double agent? Yes. yes. Um, and the goal of the story, because this is how these go, is you know they've got a, a responsibility to a evil team or something like that, a, mm-hmm. a higher dark power of some kind. Mm-hmm. But they slowly start to realize that the heroes, the the good guys, every other every other player, they're they're better people, and they kind of want to keep them safe and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, the love struck. Um, uh, Brock um, from Pokemon. Every female character from the first three series of Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, uh, Mrs. Catwoman from Zaxel. There's yes, um, one in mind from G, whose name escapes me for the moment from GX. Blair. Who is, yep, Blair. Yeah, Blair. If that's, if that's um, not the perfect case, I don't know what is. It's in my head. It's them, the um, the the Fate Seer from um, Arc V. And the um, the girl that's there, um, the the girl of the the professor, the the daughter of the professor from um, the original series. Mm-hmm. Also, deep cut, not card game related at all. Lyos Dungeon Mesh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're right. Um, the last of these is the mentor. The uh, mentor professor is Prowler. Uh, a lot of character. You could definitely argue the uh, the, the guy in Arc V that runs the whole group is definitely another example. Um, um, at you could definitely take a lot of um abilities from them and fill them into another characters. Most people in GX as well that are adults. Anyone that's an adult around kids is usually a mentor. Yeah, I'd I'd also I'd also say very very early on um gra- um Grandpa Muto. Oh. Yes, I, yeah. I would say he's more of an ally personally, but yes. Mm-hmm. The the distinction, the, one of the reasons we have these as expansion playbooks rather than core playbooks is some of their, they're a little bit more niche and they overlap with a lot of pre-existing playbooks. Um, but they are ideas that we think we can better do and are popular and we believe we can better do with um, full playbooks dedicated to them. Mm-hmm. That's, that, certainly, that certainly makes sense. Now... You, you have stated at the top at the top of it that this is me- that this is meant to encompass the encompass trading card games and bringing up Yu Gi Oh, bringing up Duel Masters, bringing up Card Fight. Those are three very very different games in terms of their in terms of their sandbox. Yeah. So yep. the big, especially since it's inevitable that people are going to want to adapt to this kind of thing into card games that you may not have even considered or may, yes. or may not have even existed yet. <laughs> They're about to hit us with chaotic. Um, um, basically, the I, I can answer what our plan is for that because we had a lot of discussions about this as we started doing the playtesting. Well, the, because... before, you, before you get to oh, that, yeah. the question that I had was how, how do you plan on drawing a through line between all of those potential variations? Narrative, mostly. Um, card game fights in um, Perfect Draw are mostly focused on the narrative aspects of a push and a pull. Mm-hmm. Um, one player is doing really well; they've got more adva- they've got more advantage. Oh no, the enemies use a counter of some kind. We've I, we basically tried to take card games, specifically, admittedly, um, very like creature combat style card games, um, and mo- taken them to their component parts, and then said. The rest of the stuff you can narrate. A lot of the moves, which are a lot of the stuff that you would be the complexities and differences between these games. Hmm. Um, stuff like um, what you do um, to counter an effect is there instant play? Is there instant effects? For example, a lot of card games don't have that, especially if they have if they're for kids. Um, 
those things are siphoned into the moves and we give tips for how to narrative narrativize that how to retcon it to make it make sense like you would retcon revealing that in a dust cloud um actually there is a that you already played a trap card if you were doing a Yu-Gi-Oh like game mm -hmm. um the the other thing we do is we recommend looking at how you can use the gimmick system how you can make cards to fit that because we've got a very very simple card game basis mm -hmm. most of the effects live in the cards and um, we've had some people come in with vanguard for example one of the weird things about vanguard is that um vanguard has these spaces that care about each other um and that's not true in most card game other card games that we'd be talking about for generic card games like mtg or Yu Gi Oh. Or even for the most part, um, um, Hearthstones or Pokemons. Mm -hmm. But we can say, okay, you can make your gimmick that we work like Vanguard. Or at the start of the game, when you sit down with everyone, we can make this a a group thing that we're all going to make our cards around. Yeah. Which definitely makes sense. And tr truth be told, and just this is just me speaking as a GM slash designer, if I were to tackle this for my own table in, at the temple... Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I would. Pro it would be. It would be a bit. I would not be using any exi any existing of the obvious card games as a base. Sim yes. Simply because I wouldn't want to distract people into thinking that they could make a copy of the of their deck. Because which is like we've tried to do. Um, our card game system. We have to be very careful. For example. Um, even though that, like, for 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 a lot of the examples, I think that Magic: The Gathering is a great basis for um, creating these designs in an open-ended way. It's fun. We it's had to make that sure up. that we had as little Magic: The Gathering in there as possible, despite that, so that people didn't think that this was just a game to port Magic: The Gathering cards into. Yeah, it's fun. It's funny you bring up Magic: The Gathering because I get. I guess. I guess one of. When it comes to the when it comes to the adventure that you put in the judges kit, I guess one of you yeah. thought you'd be slick and get and get a Richard Garfield ref reference be past me without me noticing. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, no, he's actually one of the the core characters in the book, and if now that we got the mentor funded, um, he's going to be the iconic yeah. mentor. Um, and I just think that's cute. I know, you know it's a, a yeah, nice little shout out to the guy who made um TCGs, but. The yeah. reason I bring the reason I bring him up specifically, even though you you went, you went legally is distinct by calling him Roland Garfield, is he had made he had made a remark at one point that he wanted mm -hmm. a deck of Magic the Gathering to feel to feel like a character sheet in Dungeons and Dragons. In mm. which case I think I think he overachieved because Magic the Gathering has has fighter characters that do more than just basic attack all the damn time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm get, I'm, I'm throwing all the shade. <laughs> Damn right. No, look, we 4E exists. Here. 4E it's exists. Okay. Um, it looks closer to a 4E playbook. I to to a 4E character. I think. Um, oh. MTG. I mean, you know, yeah. you got your um at wills, which I guess are your like four offs and yeah. your lower cost cards. I've, I've um, I have to, I have had I've had a bit of a career, um, taking some of the most common arguments that people make against 4E mm -hmm. and. And taking the piss out of them. Oh, I definitely agree. Four E is a great game. I don't play Four E anymore, but mostly because I think there are games that improve on the um, the problems it does have, like with monster math and so forth. Oh, yeah. And once once um thir once Thirteenth Age came along, that pr that pretty much took the spot that um Four E had yeah. for me. It doesn't exactly hurt yeah. that that um one of the people involved with thir with um Thirteenth Age. Is Rob Heinso? Yes. Oh. oh, we're actually playing a 13th age game um, right now. I'm um, GMing one, mm -hmm. and I, I definitely agree. Yeah. Although I would say, different amount of tactical combat. The tactical combat feels very different, and sometimes I do want to play a game that, fe um, that feels a little bit more like that. And that's when I say, let's play Lancer or Icons or um, Orcus or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm really excited you'd... to try out I uh, Icons and Orcus. I have. I have. You you two might get a kick out of Beacon as well. Oh yes, I I've, I've definitely um, seen Beacon there, and I it's on my list of games to try. Um, uh, I would I would have also rec I would have also recommended Unity, but the guy be but the guy behind Unity has disappeared. 
Oh. The other one I've heard um, that people have shouted out to is um, Strike, um, because it has a bunch of um, mm. toolkits you can add to it that add that add that part. But I'm anxious about anything that's like full of toolkits rather than full games. Strike. If truth be told, and this and this is my own, this is from my own experiences. Um, Fair enough. Strike is n it wouldn't have been my wouldn't have been my first um, recommend, and I I. As an aside, I have heard that the designer of Strife at Strike ended up um, getting a bunch of people mad for overshilling, for the same reason so many people are pissed off at Daniel Fox. Yeah. Oh. Oh god! Not overshilling your game is so hard. Um, well, you have to hold. In the in the case of Fox, he kept he kept shilling it in places where he sh where he shouldn't have, and he oh, got no. banned off of several forums for doing that. So it, this is not a um like I've logged onto the Reddit and um, posted my thing, um, even though they have a, um, a a rule to somewhat avoid that situation. This is more of a I've logged onto random disassociated forms that want you to be a confirmed person type situation. <sighs> Some something like that. There, <laughs> it's it's a length, it's a lengthy stupid story. I have I have not enough alcohol to get into, but I'll I'll look it up one other day. Yeah. But true, but um, I will I will note that that in the spirit of that whole thing, that whole thing of of building around building around that fact, the if there is any card game that I would use that that I'd use as a base in that situation, it mm. it's it isn't you it isn't Yu Gi Oh it isn't Magic it's it's one that it's one that got a lot of play with my with my circle because because I had oh. a strong pitch. And because it had a unique experience that a lot of people skipped out on, and that is uh -huh. the Eye of Judgment. Oh yes, 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 I entirely agree. Although it's hard to reference because it's a very niche, very, very niche. But it's a, but its approach of a, of a um, of being more about territory control rather than whittling down life is in, is interesting. And yeah. And that's something that's a little bit hard to do for our game, admittedly, just because we have a we're trying very much to represent like the Ur card game. Mm -hmm. But it is something that we have tried to make sure that there is space for as well. Yeah. Now, with the, now with that in mind, given the given the way you have um, cards designed, mm -hmm. the um this bring this brings me to. To the to the to um one per, to one partic the one particular thing the first is the tier setup that you have, um yes because you're you're do you're doing three different tiers of battle filler significant and finale yes and I think it'd be I think it'd be good to, good to dive into what would be an what would be an example of where the line between significant and finale because filler that could just be like a duel that takes place over a it's single episode. Fairly self-explanatory. A single, well, filler episode. Significant and finale. Um, I could see the I could see the line between those being a little bit trickier. So, what would you? I would say generally, if if you imagine the show as an episode, if you imagine you're making episodes, if this fight would be a two-parter, or would be like the end of the season climax to everything that's happened so far. Then it's a finale. Mm. Otherwise, it's significant. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's essentially the long and short. Mm -hmm. Now you you mentioned the whole moves and counter move thing, which um, honestly makes me think of a think of a fighting game. So it might be best to yeah. think of a deck as akin to, akin to a character in a fighting I mean, game. I think that for the most part, fighting games and card games are wildly similar. Um, yeah, with the like exception of the way that constructed works in most card games, um, but even then, in a lot of card games that we have um, today, that's not even as true. Um, like, like a lot of card games are very archetypal, almost like a fighting game. About that, I'd like to bring up mm. three words that hits the nail on the head a bit more than you may have thought. Oh, card sagas wars. Let me just look that up because I don't quite remember that. I've heard the name, but I don't remember it on the top of my head. This was yeah, I, oh. a Mugen project that got way out of hand and does implement. Oh! A, and this thing does implement a 
that implements a card mechanic. I could also bring up the skill system in Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, which is very Absolutely. much a card mechanic. Um, yep. Or, in... or most recently, there was a lot of um, shock going around when the new Strive DLC introduced a character who literally had a deck builder. Yeah. And th those can, which I don't, I don't know why that was a shock because those sort of expanding move set kind of characters are nothing new in. Um, I mean, they fighters. were they were very popular in Zerd and weren't as popular in Strive, and like basically just appeared in Strive is mostly the reason I imagine. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I, um, I've e I've even used this fighting game analogy with the two Yu-Gi-Oh decks that I did have, which all of my mm -hmm. friends. All of my friends absolutely hated when I br when I would bring these out. One of them mm -hmm. was a gravekeeper deck I called the Drunken Boxer, because yeah. the way I the way it's I had all about set... just making it so you accidentally ruin their ability to win. Well, the the approach that I had is that it was it was very very hard to predict what angle it was going to hit you with. Mm. Much much in the same way as it's very hard to predict what angle a drunken boxer is going to attack from mm -hmm. like you 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 can if you look at say um brad wong in the dead or alive games who uses drunk who uses drunken boxing you have that you have that kind of thing where he ha where he has setups that look like they're going to be high attacks that actually hit mm -hmm. low and, vi and yes. vice versa it's that same principle the other one mm -hmm. was a blitz deck that i called dead in 17 seconds because that's because mm -hmm. the first time I used it, I won a match in 17 seconds. Since it was, Lovely. it was all about exploiting a loophole using things like Goblin Attack Force and Spear Dragon, but having uh -huh. final attack orders active, so their one weakness ends up getting negated. Yeah. And instead of breaking out a breaking out big guys, breaking out stuff like that or Archfiend Soldier that could do a lot of damage when everybody is just setting things up. And mm. put and put them on the defensive when they don't have enough time to set up their bigger plays. Yeah. Well, the the ace card and this is I, even and this is very card. early Yu Gi Oh too, mm. where like archetypes didn't even like truly exist as they do today, but we're already building like a fighting game. Yeah. The ace card that I had for that for that deck was Great Maju Garzet. Mmm. Mmm. Love that. And. The reason why I used it is because is because it's cheap. The thing the yes. thing about it is mo most of the monsters that I had in that deck were not higher than level four, so I mm -hmm. could get. But they were all they're all around eighteen to two thousand um, attack. The moment you get a tempo turn in, you can then turn it into a, a guy with no downside, even if they remove your background, your backup. Mm -hmm. You can functionally just uh, spend your normal summon to double the attack of one of your guys. Yeah. Yeah. So and remove their downside, importantly, even if they're they hit the back. Yeah. True. And of course, stuff like Spear Dragon is is was used for when people wanted to play defensive because that's a that's a mm -hmm. nice defense. It's, it'd be a shame if somebody pierced it. <laughs> yeah. But oh, have you had a chance to look at Rush Jewels yet? Actually. Um, I have. Um, honestly, because I'm... it plays very similar to basically everything about that early sort of style of play where you're mm -hmm. building decks like that, but with a uh, well thought out game design. Yeah, I've lo I've looked in I've looked into it. Um, my pers my main pursuits lie at, lie elsewhere. I'm far more experimental mm -hmm. than I was back then, which is why fair I enough. Fair enough. But speak speaking of that, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to the types of cards, obviously mm -hmm. you have with a lot of them you have a you have a three tier um, setup, and mm -hmm. much like with the Rorschach test from earlier, I'd like to do I'd like to do a bit of par of parallels to kind of get a feel for what the power scale what the power scale ballpark yep. would be if you if. For lack of oh, I have this already on the top of my head. The the perfect so, example for someone who's watched the original series. So, yeah, let's 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 use that since everybody's watched it or is, or is at least familiar with the iconic monsters from that. So, yeah. what would be an example of a weak warrior? Karibo. Plapa from Pokemon TCG. Mm -hmm. Um, a normal Birds of paradise. Um, yeah. uh, for a normal um, just like 
Probably like your Dark Magicians. No, Dark Magicians are strong. I think it's Good a Gemini point. Elf. Yeah, Gemini Elf is strong. Uh, is a strong choice. Your Gemini Elf or your um, Celtic Guardian, mm. basically. Oh. Yeah, fair. Kill and... Giant if we want to use another um, MTG example. Um, strong. Blue Eyes. White uh, Dragon. Blue Eyes. Blue Eyes. Would you would you say the the barrier between um, normal and strong is is a lot of these strong types would be ones that would require either sacrifices in in the OG or or rituals or so some the way we have it um, the way we have it set up Very is that yes so long as because they give you zero they give you zero ability to have while you're um, while you're making a card when you make a card you get the number of effect points to make effects mm -hmm. strong warriors give you zero effect points so if you want to give them any effects you need to give them a downside but you can still have a warrior who's like, my thing is that I'm strong. I do nothing else. Yeah. Um. And tr truth be told, since I've get, since I've, I've been I've been playing a lot of Infinity at my L at my LGS and I and something I may consider down the road is taking some of the factions in that setting and seeing if I can make mm -hmm. cards out of them because it's always funny whenever whenever Warhammer players try out Infinity for the first time because they think. I'm going to do the charge like I did like I did in War like I did in Warhammer 40k and and I'll be fine. And then they get shredded. Because yeah. one of the rules that in, that Infinity has is if when you activate a unit, any opposing unit that has line of sight gets one free shot. Yeah. So the whole charging on open ground like an idiot is a good way to get yourself full of holes. Yeah. Um now I, believe I will say Oh, yeah. As just a, a weird little thing to wrap back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of this um, podcast about a uh, podcast interview mm -hmm. about why we made why the games been, been made in our history is with um, card games. Mm -hmm. As someone who spent a lot of time on Yu-Gi-Oh card maker and a lot of time watching the anime, what, wishing for the thing that the anime does, which is everyone has a deck that is like theirs. This is a deck that represents something about my person, maybe tells a story about me. Mm -hmm. And that's just impossible in a real card game. Um, it, to, to some extent, obviously, if you're lucky, there are some things like that, but if, if you're, you're playing... very lucky, the deck that represents you might become tier one, but only but if you you're lucky. you can't have it be good. Uh, like, you can't have everything be good. Mm. But by making more narrative rules, and by making it so that you can, you know, like, you're, you can make your card with whatever theme, you know, the car the guy, you get to make the card, we don't just give you, um, the tool sets. You retheme it however you want, you make a new card with a weird effect. You can have it represent that thing and answer that sort of um, narrative, which is to say, to, to wrap it into Infinity here, one of the cool things we really wanted to do is make it so that if you wanted to do that playstyle, you could force it to be good. And the reason why I, br I bring up wargaming as as a as a parallel yeah. to this is that is um even with even with the point limits, you know, because mm. a a war game match is going to have a li a limit of a certain amount of points, and that's Usually the the um, baseline that you have to do when making your army, with with both mm. units, with um ve with vehicles, with he with heroes or le or legendaries, which sometimes have their own restrictions. Yeah. And with equipment and certain modifiers, each army each army, no matter how much customization that army may have, will always have a certain um, leaning. In yes. For, in forty k, for instance. Orcs will always be will always be very very shit at shooting things. Yes. <laughs> Which is why there's the whole DACA thing because in order to more DACA because they're um in order in order to actually hit something they need like fives and a bunch of fives and sixes otherwise they win. If you're playing those guys they're going to be really good at doing like a swarm style gameplay but they're not going to be great if you just want to do like the, the styles that other other ones do where you just have like a fuck like you're you're playing knights and you got just one they're, big fuck fuck off unit. They're no um what you're referring to as the big unit is is often called distraction carnifex. Yes. You know the the big unit that's meant to take up that's meant to draw all the attention while you at while you have some sort of diversion that's the actual attack cuz one of the rules mm -hmm. of combat is the diversion you're ignoring is the actual main f attack. <laughs> yes. Oh. Um. Especially now that, um, because Warhammer's current rules right now are all about, um, controlling spaces, right? 
spatial control's been a thing for the longest time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it hasn't really been a, um, a a kill all of your other guys thing for a long time, I take it. No, a lot... Um, the that sort of total victory is lo is a long, boring slog. A lot of ma a lot of matches were, will either be about taking out the HQ or some sort of victory point system. Makes sense. Makes sense. Because that whole that whole thing of take out all, take out all the enemies that can work in like a in like a card game where you have less moving parts. But mm -hmm. in a war game, but when you're having to deal with numerous different mini figurines it's going to bog things down when eventually there's, someone's going to have like two, two two guys left and someone else has 20 and you start getting into that chess situation where you just have the king run away yeah oh now there's also that same three tier setup when it or at least something close when it comes to um items so i'd li mm. i'd like to play that same um word association when it comes to items what what from the what what from the early days would you consider a weak item and for the purposes of this That's i'm all... stretching items to be both spell and trap cards so one That's of the things i will say is that items are a little bit weird because we decided as a way to make sure that everyone can always like deal with a threat that they will have strength values mm -hmm. and this is not something that is entirely representative in most card games um, yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, and you know, MTG don't have, like, you can't have a warrior attack an item, for example. I think the closest examples would be either weapons from Hearthstone and how they have durability, or, yes. like... L5R uh, is yeah. all about, it has a lot of this. Yes, you know L5R is a good example. You know the classic attack the moon thing in the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime? Yeah. What if you could do that to any, like, field spell or artifact or, or land but or the like? That's a good example, dear, because we what we can do is we can definitely say what we would make um, generally and what we would consider we, you should, like, cost these things. For example, um, a, a weak item would be, like, your average treasure token or um, food token or whatever in MTG. Whereas a strong item... Um, might be something where you'd consider a um, like a, 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 a powerful sword, um, an equip, or something like that. Mm. And then a strong I item disagree. Is... I think some things could be strong but fragile in order to reflect true, weak. True. Because, uh, I feel like something that's strong would more realistically often be something that's hard to destroy and thus, or something like a temple or a garden. Like you're not going to yes. ruin that without exceeding. Like cards that would be that. harder to deal with is probably a better example. It's very hard to deal with a um an, an, a card. Uh, I'm trying to think of a good example of a card, like a back row card with protection. Like earlier in Yu-Gi-Oh is probably a good example Swords. where a lot of face down cards were harder to deal with. Swords of Revealing Light is another example, although that one would be a funny one, of course, because it would stop attacks in general, so you couldn't destroy it in that feature anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. I know that a lot of I know that a good way to get people salty back, back in the early days was. My abuse of trap hole. Yes. <laughs> somebody, um, especially when it kills somebody's ace card. Yeah, but this is to say, I don't think there is exact equivalence for item stuff. Mostly, what it is is a trade-off because you get more effect points the more the the weaker your item is. Mm -hmm. So stronger items, you will have to do more work to protect if you want them to do cooler things. Whereas weaker items, who are going to do less, are going to stay around more. Um, and that's just an, uh, a way to make sure that no matter what, while you're playing, there, there's always going to be back and forth between your core card types. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I can, I can get, I can get that. And I'd imagine, I'd imagine that when it comes to people, when it comes to people making the cards that the, that they would have for their characters, the mm -hmm. total the total amount of cards is probably not going to be more than 10. No, we have 4. 4 is the limit. Starting uh, uh, the starting the starting card number is 4. It used to be 6, but it turned out that having 6 starting cards was for the most would, moment uh, for like uh, a lot of people that was asking too much and we wanted to like compress things down. So now it's 4 plus you have your staples which helps you so you have the fact sort of seven small. effective cards, mm -hmm. um, and then you always draw new cards. I think a good example of that is just remember that when you're starting out, these are the cards that are, that are showing up. 
If you watch like, a lot of these um, original series, you'll see that they only play a couple of cards at the very start of these episodes, and then every game they're revealing one or two. Yeah, and that is uh, because you've got your draw the perfect card. The... Um, but at the same time, we do have rules for if you want to have more. That that's in the judges' handbook. Yeah. There, ad admittedly, there there is one character who, for shits and giggles, I I put in a Yu Gi Oh like. Mm -hmm like world who it who because I felt he would be too perfect of a fit and be a bit of a menace in that kind of setting uh -huh. from an from an anime that is a bit of a deep cut but uh, but is a favorite of mine from the from the late 2000s mm. and that is Akagi. Yeah. The, the okay. genius who descended into darkness. Yeah, mm. I I haven't watched that yet because uh, I refuse to learn the rules of Mahjong, but I have watched Kaiji, which I understand is related. It's in the, it's in the same universe. There is also a, mon a manga called Ten, which, to my knowledge, has mm. not been made into an anime. Akagi no, is meant but... to be a spin-off because his character does show up in a much old in a much older form in Ten. Um, Kai... I think it makes perfect sense that a, um, a a mahjong playing character would be very fitting to a card game world because I think most of the tropes that lean into uh, like the TCGs get created from and card games get created from come from these very early classic card games. Yeah, uh, in the same way, and I think mahjong is usually one of the better examples of it because it actually because it um, because it's not always the same type of a betting game, and it's not also a everything's already on the board strategic game like say go or chess and the thing the thing with akagi that i do i do need to clarify is it's not just mahjong it's oh. reach Maj, it's reach style mahjong oh yes of course which yeah. um, is a whole different can of worms compared to normal mahjong it may as well be yes. a completely different game although i would argue is probably the most popular way of playing it now oh i'd I'd say that's cert that, that certainly helped through the popularity of like the um, Yakuza slash Ryuga Gotoku games. Yeah. Fair. Oh. I did ha I did have a a a um, version of Reach Mahjong in game in um, PC game form <laughs> on my on my old computer, and I sucked. <laughs> yeah. It's... It is a really hard game to grok because. The the hands are not all that like most of the hands are as simple as poker hands, but not all of them. Um, and to do really really well, you have to learn the ones that aren't just the poker hands. Yeah, but the reason the reason why I brought up Akagi is not just his skill with playing mahjong, but but more of how. Mm -hmm. Because because his play st his playing style is far more of a psychological game. You know, when, yes. when it comes to bluffing, when it comes to um, cold, when it comes to cold reading his opponents, and occasionally cheating in a way in a way that his opponent knows mm -hmm. that he cheated, but he can't do anything about it. Like in the first episode, mm -hmm. midway through the game, he's playing. Um, one of the other players who who is a member of the yakuza figures out that he's cheating, but he can't but he can't make a stink about it because there's a there's a, because there's a if he proves it's not yeah. watching the whole thing, <laughs> and if he, yeah. if he if he if he if he makes any trouble, then that detective will have the perfect excuse, which is yes. why Akagi gets called a monster because he set that he set that whole thing up, mm -hmm. no knowing uh, what could happen. And I'll say what I'm, I'm sure Iris is also thinking: uh, this is exactly what the rogue is fit for. Um, we designed the rogue with um, these sorts of characters in mind. Including yeah. giving them abilities that um, allow them to do things. You know, taking some inspirations from, I think, the modern design of how you do these like super smart characters, which is to say, you ha you allow the player to have the ability to retcon that this was all part of their plan and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and just... that they've uh, they they could cheat in this sort of way and whatnot. I think it. I it's. I think it's important to bring that up with like the rogue because I think it would be easy to assume that the rogue is meant to be this master strategist. Akaki mm -hmm. Shigeru is not a master strategist. He's just a bastard. <laughs> yes. And you can absolutely do like the be like a shit heel. That, 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 that's one of the reasons why we uh, I, I think personally in these sorts of designs, especially when you're using playbooks, mm -hmm. which do have a lot of um, narrative restrictions to them. You know, you're guiding people into basically 
10 pseudo-controlled stories. Yeah. Making sure that they are as open as possible despite that. You know, we're giving you the tools to create these sort of stories, but you can do that story in any way, I think is very important. And especially... One of the things I always like is take is taking things that a lot of people think are cliche and putting spins on them that they mm-hmm. that they didn't consider. Um, because I remember having a debate with a buddy of mine who was like, "Why why do we keep having to, having to have tournament arcs and shown in battle manga?" Yes, and I I had I had said, "Well, it's it's a it's a very efficient way to have to have um, fights with a variety of characters, and if you want to blame anything." For the popularity of the tur- of the Yu Yu Hakusho of the tournament concept, the patient zero is master of the flying guillotine. True, true. Since I the- would still say Yu Yu Hakusho very much popularized it. Um, it, cer- it certainly helped. Mo- it certainly helped move things along. But the but the pr- the premise for master of the flying guillotine, if you haven't seen it, is an assassin mm. setting up a fighting tournament to lure out. The to to lure out the martial artist who killed his students. Sound familiar? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You always. This is sort of the trick I think to tournament arcs that separates the good tournament arcs to the bad ones. Uh, And and using an example from our, um, we 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 try and push that actually very precisely in the um, demo adventure we give. A good tournament arc has something fucked up happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should never be about the tournament, so to speak. Like, yeah. It's a good excuse to let some characters get cool matches that might not happen otherwise and gather the cast together. But it is an excuse. There needs to be something else going on there, uh, like something behind the scenes, a real motivation for the tourney, etc. Uh, a good example in Yu-Gi-Oh! actually, I think, legitimately is, and I think that, frankly, this is one of the things that DM actually does fairly badly compared to later series. Um, both GX and later Arc V have this really good tournament arc where eventually you get to reveal that, no, this is actually a a sort of test or checking out something or getting more information out of people. And before we even get to, like, the the final battles, we're already dealing with this really... the new new complexity that's been introduced to the world that we spent the whole tournament arc hinting at and making sure that you're, um, that you're asking questions. You're excited for the next battle with the next guy because... Maybe he might explain a little bit more about the mystery, more so than yeah, anything like, else. The fact that Arc V like does the tournament arc first part as a battle royale, and then when it gets up to the part where it would start being bracketed fights, it's just like, yeah, we were fucking with you. This was just super soldier training. Congratulations, you're enlisted for an interdimensional war. Go in this portal. Yeah, and of course, the the thing that makes it work really well is that it's hinted at every um every good episode. This and that episode's five D. Um, where they, uh, not 5D, there's a bad episode of Arc V, um, but every, every, every battle, you end up with a guy who appears here, and you have no idea what he's doing. They're using, um, summoning mechanics that should not exist, or whatnot. Um, and that gets to be the, the big pull you through. And if you're doing a tournament arc, you want to make sure, 100%, that every fight is wildly confusing and questioning um, and building mm-hmm. than just an excuse to fight. Yeah. Though, oddly, oddly enough, I've I've stated that there's there is a there is one source of inspiration that can be used for ter- that can be used for tournament arcs that mm-hmm. I think a lot I think a lot of people ov- overlook because it's technically not dealing with not um, within the confines of anime because yeah. I'm a big fan of Puroress. And there is one ter- yeah. there is one tournament in New Japan that I always make a point of watching. Yeah, and that's the G one. Yes, the Give G- it a bit. The G one is a round robin tournament that takes place over mm-hmm. a few months. The winner of that it is guaranteed the main event spot at Wrestle Kingdom in the Tokyo Dome. Um, yes, in ja- in January every year. Um. For a few for a, f- a few years ago, they started doing this thing where you have a briefcase that guar- that has that guaranteed contract, but if you lose a match until that point, you lose that briefcase. Which mm-hmm. was that was something that Kazuchika Okada had had come up with as a bit a bit of a um, jab at at 
the money in the bank concept that WWE does because he didn't like that somebody would win that contract and then lose for several months, then cash it yes. in. Oh, yeah. But fair. With it, with was, those, I with, think so, I think. there have been plenty of stories within, within the story when it comes to those sorts of G1 round Robins, whether it, whether it be the, whether it be the older guy who who's still showing that he can, ha that he can hang or newer folks getting getting the rude awakening on how grueling the tur the tournament is. Yes. Um, you have you have that concept of story within a, within a story. Um, AEW yeah. over here in the states did a, their own thing with their own version of a round robin with the Continental Classic le late last year, and one of the big yes. stories out of that was um was Eddie Kingston putting both his New Japan Strong title and his um R and his ROH heavyweight title on the on the line for it. Um I like, either... wrestling is I think always a good example of how to do good pseudo serialized storytelling. Because yeah. it's been successful for a long time for a good reason. And I know I know a lot of people and I know I know a lot of people will will overlook because they because they're going to use that fa that fake argument for the long that's been dead I for mean, the longest time. We're literally talking about um, like anime here, which we're is to say, well, it's, in it's, to it's the not like wrestling. And, game. It's not like wrestling and anime haven't crossed over in the in the past already. I mean, Tiger Mask, yeah, Jushin, like, yeah. Jushin Liger. Oh, I mean, realistically, like, again, Dragon Ball Z takes huge inspirations from the wrestling format, and it defines the shonen battle and the shonen battle manga. And like, buddy, we're all marks here. There. Shut up and get to the drama. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but um, yeah, like, uh... but there's oh, there's also the, there's also the fact that you ha that um you have a means to. To e to easily tell easily tell that kind of story, with as few mm. as few um, extra baggage as is needed. Yes. Oh, which is which is what makes that kind of thing enduring. I've I've often told people yeah. stop stop trying to fight against the cliche because you're going to make a self fulfilling prophecy, or at least don't yeah. fight against the cliche for its own sake. Oh, um, know why you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, at the very least, like if you ha are doing this for a very clean purpose, but there there is reasons why some of these work. There's obviously reasons where some of these like some of these work, but they're also bad. Um, obviously, like there's the cliche that we can bring up of like um the way women are treated in basically everything, and that's something we can get rid of with purpose. Um, but getting rid of the fun of like a, a rival character is a really good example, and those. Those do well because they're fun and exciting, and they pull towards the the next narrative arc very accessibly. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, actually, we do have a house inspection sometime soon, so we should probably wrap yeah. up. So now it, I, I, well, I believe it's about house inspection up later today. Yeah. it is a little bit, but they can come earlier, so we should be sure and not have to end out too early. Yeah. So with so. With them, they say it's between two forty-five p.m. and five p.m., so we're fine. Yeah, with that. Oh, okay. With that in mind, um, now I What are you shooting? What are you shooting for as far as a as far as a total page count for the core book? We're actually done uh, with the core book technically, well, sort of. We've te we're technically finished with the core book right now, and it ranks up at about two hundred and fifteen pages. But given that However, we're going to be having we're going to be adding more pages to fit in people's NP, uh, like a backer tier NPCs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I would expect um, and the commissioned ones. Already... So I think we end up, yeah, at one hundred and twenty-eight. I think is the current map. No, dear, it's currently two hundred and uh, ten pages. So yeah, and then we add in the six guys and the commissioned ones, dear. You forgot about the commissioned ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So two hundred and twenty-eight sounds about. And Roughly, I think it could be less, could be more, depending on how the commissions go. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a um, for lack of a better term, a ballpark, a net, a broad net. Oh, we wrote that on the backer kicks. I did the calculations there. Let me just go check that. Um, 
May. May is where we currently have it planned. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, but... when people should get their final PDFs and where they should start uh, uh, start seeing news that their um their their books are being sent out. Oh yeah. Look forward to it. But I will cert I will certainly be looking forward to it and le like I said there's there's going there's going to be some t some tweaks that I'm that I'm likely to do that are going to be a bit a bit um unexpected. Because... I'll say this um we're, we're I'm not a cop. Um we, you know we did our design on the game and we we lent it to what we did for reasons that came out in playtesting. Mm -hmm. Neither of us are cops though. Uh, we're not going to come into your house and um like get you and arrest you because you're playing the game wrong. Do whatever the hell you like. No, you, no, your game designer is not Grognards. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we we give. I will say for a lot of the things that we did, we do give a lot of advice in the judges' handbook and where they come up for why we did that. Mm -hmm. Um, and advice for if you do change it. Yeah. Um, we we've seen some people try and edit things. For example, like how the game plays without recognizing that when you change how the game plays the math for card creation needs to be reconsidered as well. Yeah. Um, as do a lot of the staples. Mm -hmm. I, I can certainly get that. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your s schedules and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way to thank my you. temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Thank it's you. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often Lovely. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and have a water bottle right next to me. That's all you're going to be I getting. Got mine. I'm really thirsty at this point. Oh. Well, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until yep. then... On behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Ciao! See ya!